Hi, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time zone that you're watching, WOCP TV. And I'm your host, Jasmine Farnham, and I want to welcome to uh, this UFU interview expert panel, Dana Verde, independent filmmaker. Welcome, Dana. How are you? Good. I'm fine, and thank you for having me. Oh, it's awesome to have you. I, I, I share a little uh, secret with you guys. Dana and I uh, have met one time. Uh, she came out and supported a event that I was having for another non-for-profit that I was briefly involved with, Art in the Box, and we have fell in love with her. We know her mom. She's a dear sister. So this is like me interviewing my little niece. She's she's a baby to uh, WOCP. She's also part of our on our international international advisory board. So. It is really an honor and a privilege to have you be the first Ubu expert guest on WOCP TV. Wow. Thank you. You're <laughs> here, young lady. It's history. I am so honored. Thank you. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Listen, I want to give you an opportunity to uh, just take the reins of the production and tell our viewers about how you got started in filmmaking as an independent uh, filmmaker, woman, of African Caribbean descent, just talk to us very, very freely. Okay. Okay, my history is long. <laughs> I actually decided to become a screenwriter when I was in high school. Um, you know, like everyone, I watched a lot of movies and I fell in love with cinema. And um, at first I thought just to be a writer. And it wasn't until I was about 19 and I saw this film called Daughters of the Dust. I don't know if you know it. But uh, it's a beautiful, watch it. It's a beautiful movie. It's done by an African-American woman filmmaker. Um, her name is Julie Dash. And it was beautiful. It was cinematic. And it reminded me so much of my own culture coming from a Caribbean background. And um, I had no idea that black women were independent filmmakers until then. Wow. And that's what made the shift. Like, she totally inspired me. And... Um, I thought, wow, I can be more than a writer. I can actually be the director. I can actually be the filmmaker. So that, and I had a professor when I was uh, a, a sophomore in college, when I was studying screenwriting, she told me, she goes, you think like a filmmaker, and you should pursue this. And I was like, wow. What does, that what just she, blew my what mind. What did she mean by that? What did she mean by that? You think like a filmmaker. We had a class called The Business of, of Screenwriting, and what we had to do was pitch story. Like, we'd write our scripts, and we'd have to pitch them. we have pitch sessions. And she was like, just the way that I think about the approach to, to, to writing is more like a filmmaker because I'm very cinematic. You know, I think in terms of camera angles and, and so much more detail than just writing. And she was like, you think like a filmmaker, and you should really, really pursue it. And... I took her advice to heart, and from then on, I was like, that's what I'm going to do. Did you know that you were thinking like a filmmaker? Did you no, know? No, I just, no, I just thought it was just storytelling. You know, I didn't see the difference. I didn't think that, I didn't think that my process was more visual than it was written, because I really fell in love with the written word. I lo always loved books and stuff like that, so I thought I was more of a writer. Mm -hmm. But no, and so she brought that to my attention. She was like, you're very visual. And even when I was in film school, all the cinematographers always loved my writing. They're like, you write for camera. You write to, like, make beautiful pictures. And I was like, really? I never saw that in myself. But once I embraced it, I realized I, I am a filmmaker. Okay. Yeah. I kind of had that um, experience myself. I didn't, I didn't even realize it was more so out of necessity, me even mm -hmm. going behind the camera. But I simply love it. Um, and also right. you know, being able to edit the films, that's another hat, you know, that's totally different. Just seeing um, the story unfold as, you, as you've captured the footage, now you're sitting down and you're looking at it to really pull the story out the way that's most impactful. So that's awesome. You know, I know um, the challenges because you were, were formerly a resident of Brooklyn. Uh, you mm -hmm. have uh, recently you know, going to the West Coast, and we miss you here, definitely. Yeah. Uh, pitching out in Hollywood, I know from reading the bio and um, from uh, what I saw on, on your interviews, uh, talk to us about that. It's just a different world out there, isn't it? 
It is a different world, and I miss New York terribly. <laughs> I talk about it all the time, how different New York and L.A. is. Out here, it is it is very much, um, to me, they, they're very disconnected to the creative process, which is strange because I'm like, you guys are an industry that is fueled by creative people, by actors and writers. and But, um, you know, they really see it more of a business. Yeah. And so, you know, so... Story kind of takes the back seat sometimes, or taking risk or having real vision takes the back seat. They just want to know will it make you know will it make the box office numbers, and so that's the challenge when you're trying to explain to them, hey, there's an audience out here that you're ignoring, or people want you know different stories that you know, or they want more diversity in what they see. They don't believe that. They think no, this is what's tried and true. Let's stick to that, and let's make ten more of the same movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and I, that's the I, I challenge. contributed that a lot to. Um, they're still very much behind mass marketing, and because yeah. social media has opened up another window for them to know exactly, per se, what they think we think. You know, yeah. Um, they want to feed us that type of stuff, and it's. It's tired. It's just like listening to the same yeah. type of music over and over again. You just like yeah. They all sound alike after a while. So you know yeah yeah. yeah. What do you? And that's how I feel about film. That's how I feel about film. It's the same. They want the same thing. They don't want different. Mhm. Yeah. Well, that's the big production houses, which really have uh, things on lockdown. But you and I work from a different aspect. Independent. Yeah. Indie. Uh, and 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 that that sometimes is a little more tougher because we have to still make money at the you know craft that we present to people. Uh, even though you're giving them quality stuff, you have a ma- mastered uh, impactful filmmaking in shorts. Uh, I saw clips of you know um, lock and key, and you know what you were able to do in a short span of time to impact socially is that's an art form you know that you reach to me a level of expertise because the message is so powerful that even though it's five or seven or ten minutes it stays with you and the storyline most of your storylines are very relational um and that speaks to me you know in in, in the things that I want to see represented in cinema that regards our lives so where does right. that come from? Why, why so relational? Um, I think because I like films that are reflective. You know, that's just my personal taste. I, I don't always go to the film to escape. I sometimes go to, to watch films to learn, to grow, to walk in someone else's shoes and kind of like, um, you know, get a kinship with them, somebody that I, I might know or don't know that well, but I want to know them through cinema. So when I sit down and write, I think about stuff like that. I think I, I watch what's going on around me, right. and I kind of listen to people, and I, I, I take it in. You know, I take it in. Like, even Lock and Key, it came from a guy that I used to date who, who never knew his dad. And I know how much that's impacted his life, even though he tries to play it off. Mm-hmm. And because he had this level of denial, um, and, you know, a guy, and plus he's a, a guy and a Caribbean he ain't going to therapy, and he's not really going to talk about things. So I no, thought, no, 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 that's taboo. No therapy. No, that's not going to happen. So I thought, let me address what he's going through, but in a creative way. In film. And yeah. actually, when yeah, you know, when I first made the film, I, he was the first person I sent it to, and he was blown away. He was like, I love it, and of course, he could relate to it more than than anyone. And and the irony was, he didn't realize I was taking from his life in a way. And, and making a story out of it, you know, what if he ran into his father again, and how would that mm-hmm. situation be? But um, that's where I, I come from. I just come from a place of watching people around me and watching my environment and wanting to talk about it, wanting to reflect us. Yeah, I think typically uh, being, you know, um, African American, and the assumption with people who don't look like us telling our stories. Uh, in sitcom or in, you know, some other fashion, their perception of how we are and what we live and what we think, the storylines 
sometimes are not that impactful because it doesn't come from us. Uh, the, yeah. the producers, the directors, the powers that be sometimes don't want to tell our story, you know, our story. And when they do, it just comes off as something fake and and and, and forced. Um, would you agree with that? I 100% agree. I think that they don't give us the same type of depth in our characters that you see in maybe more um, European or white American stories. You know, their characters have so many layers. And, and our stories kind of just brush the surface. I don't think we've ever really gotten deep, too deep in our cinema yet. And uh, that's something I want to change, you know. I and think we, we can talk about I, it. I said that on um, WLCP Radio, that you make us look deeper. You make us look at the chords that um, connect us uh, culturally, we have this diversity. Yes, we do. But anyone could experience what your former friend did in terms of not knowing yeah. their father. Uh, your yeah. show, your, your latest production of Promise that is on Indiegogo, and we're going to put that clip up, and we're going to give them the link to go to the Indiegogo long after. We, we really want to support a Promise, which is a story of a single mom. I, and it took me back to the point in time in my life when I was a single mom some of the decisions wow. that I had to make. I grew up yeah. with a single mom who was an alcoholic functioning. She worked yeah. three jobs, but in order to cope with... <laughs> Sorry about that. I mean, it's, it's okay. You know, in a what can we do? This is Brooklyn, New York. In a minute, you're going to hear Brooklyn. It will remind you of Brooklyn, baby. Uh, but, yeah, the, the thing about it is, you know, she dealt with some tough decisions, such as yeah. You know, not being able to raise my older sister because of health mm-hmm. issues and other issues. Mm-hmm. And my my older sister was uh, completely raised by a great aunt. You know, she didn't live in a household with us. She she then experienced uh, making another decision to, you know, uh, uproot my, my siblings and myself and move to Philadelphia and transition because the support systems weren't there and her health was failing. So when this, you know, we're just looking at the synopsis and your promo, we are so inspired and so waiting to see this a promise come to fruition to the screen and any format. If it doesn't make it to the big screen, bring it to YouTube or something, you know, put a, put a list up there and we have to pay you directly $5 and the whole $5 goes to you. Um, it, is, it is so profound in such a young uh, person that makes us that aware, and that's why we chose you for that platform of Women on Fire on the front lines of social change, because through film, you're actually giving, that, giving us that opportunity to really look a lot, uh, look outside ourselves as well as deeper in ourselves and see the connectivity and see ourselves. So we appreciate you uh, for that. Um, I want to talk, switch modes and talk to you a little bit about technology the technology okay. that we can use today to really get our subjects in film um, told, uh, you know, as opposed to going through the traditional methods of the big-time production houses in Hollywood. Yeah, no, I, I'm so glad, and I can see even from when I graduated from school, which was five years ago, five years ago this month oh, is when I graduated. You. Yeah, thank yes. you. It's my five-year yes. anniversary. Yes, <laughs> And I can see... I, I can see how much it's changed, like, in five years. I can't believe it. Um, It's great. I actually think this is, this could end up being a really golden age for for black cinema because it's cheaper with the cameras now. Um, We can tell our stories, and we can go directly to our audience. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go to distributors, and we don't have to negotiate if if we choose not to with studios because we can just sit down and write it get our own people, go and shoot it, and like you said, put it on YouTube, put it online, put it on Amazon. You know, there's so many platforms right now to distribute your film that you don't have to go theatrical, and you can still find your audience. And so I'm that makes me happy, and that's what I've been trying to tell people out here in L.A. They're a little bit slower. They still want to do the traditional, it has to be in theaters, but my philosophy is I'm a filmmaker because I want to connect with other people. Exactly. So it doesn't matter how it gets out there as long as I, I gets out there. 
Yeah. So I think that um, as filmmakers, it's, I mean, you could even build a site and just put it up there and have it streaming from Vimeo if you just really wanted to show people. And you can monetize it, your, you know, you can monetize it through PayPal or to yeah. sell your, your movies now. So it's just so, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work when you do it yourself. But um, it can be done. So I think I would like to encourage anybody out there, start just start making your films. Yeah. We have uh, connected with a few filmmakers in our amateurs way. You know, we're newbie to, to the industry. Uh, doing television production is not like doing a documentary, particularly the type of documentaries that I like to do are real short and simple and sweet. And it tells the depth of someone's life or story. So... It's autobiographical. Um, what what I have and what I started with, people wouldn't believe. That the, the little point and shoot clip camera that I had, that I was actually doing documentary with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I do have access because I'm a you know BCAT producer, so we have access to all that equipment. And I tell you, I'm an old girl, so look at that stuff around on my shoulder. I'm like, let me just get my point and shoot, and I'll show you. You know, people don't yeah. believe it, but uh, I have a Nikon, but this little Panasonic, let me hold it up real good uh -huh. so people can see, it's one of the top line in the point and shoot, and, you know, it just, it do what it do, and this is what yeah. people are seeing on TV. Oh, yeah. You can, you, can make, you can make a film now with your mobile phone if you yes. wanted to. Like so, it's, I mean, it's, and you there's know, so many tools out any, there. We don't have to blow up any cars. We don't have a budget that you know millions of dollars, and you know we're not going to hit yeah. the box office and make a million overnight. But I can guarantee you, with uh, creative thinking and creative mm -hmm. ways to put, to monetize uh, your product, your film, your music. Uh, we, we, AM Power Networking on the East Coast, we had a Google Hangout. And I, mm -hmm. ding, 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 lights were going off all over the place because people are literally having concerts, full outright concerts, webinars wow. on this Google Hangout. And here we are on, on Uvu. You're in Los Angeles, California? Yes, I am. And I'm here in Brooklyn, New York. And this is yes. on, this is live on TV. I mean, we pre-record. It's going on TV. It's going on Uvu. You know, yeah. uh, we can actually do an uh, a Uvu interview and have people or a Google Hangout uh, monetize that. Send the invite. You pay for your invite, ten or fifteen dollars, whatever we're going to charge you, and do it. I mean, we are actually going to do our national conference this year via uh -huh. the technology. Wow, I think it's great, and I, I, it's powerful. It's it, it it gives you power and it gives you control. It's really empowering right now. So I love it. I'm trying to use it more because when I when I first got out of school, I did a web series, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And at the time, I didn't really take advantage of the technology the way I should have. Like I put it out there, but I didn't really market it and stuff like that. But it was a really good learning experience and. In my future, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to make films and then give and, and distribute them directly to my audience. Mm -hmm. I, I really hope to do that. I'm trying to figure out a way where I can build my audience and then they can just go to my site and I put my films up there and they can watch. Because it's really important just to have your audience. It's it's to me, it's not so so important to have the red carpet and all that. That's not why I became a filmmaker. I really became a filmmaker to to, to inspire people. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really why I'm doing it. But I'll, I'll tell you, like I told the folks in, in the AM Power Networking, valuation, understanding value, and then value begins to come to you. Once you put that in the in the atmosphere, in the environment, that these films are worth your 5 yeah. or $10. And then yeah. you begin to start moving toward the direction of getting what you're worth. Um, you're going to have talent come that you're going to want to pay. You're going to have attorneys uh, yeah. that, you know, are willing to come because they believe in the message that you're disseminating. And all of yeah. these experts, they have come with a value. 
So you put your price point there, and then you begin to do that. Bring br- bring in sponsors. You know, this is yeah. the message that we yeah. want to write your sponsorship proposal, get your advertisers there, because now uh, <clears throat> who wants to have, you know, a million-dollar budget for advertising for 30 seconds on, you know, primetime yeah. TV? That's even yeah. shifting. So the, yes. the door is really open for you to say, hey, listen, product placement in my yes. face. You know, yes. uh, you, yes. you, do, you want, do you want Michael to eat post? Or would you like them to eat Kellogg cereal for breakfast this morning? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Product I've actually been talking to my producers about that. We've been talking about, um, cause I went to a workshop a few years ago that Women in Film had, um, mm-hmm. which was about brand sponsoring. Mm-hmm. And there was this film that was made, was completely funded by Geico. They ended up putting up the $2 million to make this film. You know, Geico was all over the movie. But that's how they got funded, and, and so yeah, that's definitely another way that people can get their their films made if they don't have the funds to invest themselves, or if traditional fundraising mm-hmm. doesn't work out. You can always try and do um, brand sponsorship. Yeah, last year uh, we we wanted to have you participate with our Relationship Matters Film Festival, which was housed inside of uh, the Pocono Mountains Film Festival because of the subject matter of domestic violence and family. And a lot of times people think domestic violence is simply your your black eyes or the broken arms or, you know, God forbid, um, you know, the death. That's domestic violence. But domestic violence can be financial. It can be sexual. It can be as simple as neglect. And your film showed that there was a father who left a son. You know, um, this current character... um, she is accused of ne- neglect in some sort of a way, and they're saying, okay, send your child here because he'll have a better opportunity. So yeah. domestic violence is minimized a lot of times because of the perception of what it entails. And if you don't have the broken arm or, you know, the black eyes and, and that kind of stuff, people are not looking, you know, looking at it. I would look at partnering with uh, single mother organizations, um, Mothers who, like we had on the sh- on the show just before, um, mothers who've lost their children to gun violence or some other violence. We had three women on telling their story. These the, these are the type of people that may be interested in um, giving you a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand to get the production going. Just the research is going to come behind the scenes of who this type of film speaks to and how their message can also be a part. Who says it has to be a straight uh, movie that doesn't also have a PSA in there at the end or the beginning instead of putting right. those, you know, commercial promos. So there's all kinds of ways right. to do it. Right. You could actually take a promise and turn it into a web series, you know? Yeah, yeah, it, it actually could. It could, it, yeah. it could be because it was. it's definitely important to me to, like, um, what you were saying, like uh, domestic violence, people do think, or even abuse, people think abuse is always just physical or sexual, but there's also psychological and emotional. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we really deal with the long-term effects of neglect on someone. Mm-hmm. And that's what I kind of wanted to deal with in the film, like, and also how cycles happen, how it gets passed on from one generation to the next. And, and I wanted to show my character how she's trying hard to break that cycle. And how hard it is when you're a single mom. You have so much to deal with. I hats off to you. Hats off to all single moms because when I sat and wrote the script, that's the first thing I thought about was the sacrifices that women have to make when they have children. And every day is this constant decision about what's best for me and what's best for my child and giving up what's best for you for your child. And I don't think we, we really appreciate that on a national level. Like, we don't really understand. Like, you know, we have Mother's Day, and we say, oh, Mom, thanks, and we give a gift. But I'm like, Mother's, you know, 365 go through, like, so much. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to show that, like, a young, and a young mother struggling with all these issues and still being a strong woman, still being independent, still having humor, still mm-hmm. having intelligence, because that's something else I don't see. Whenever we show inner-city moms, they're always broken and downtrodden and I was like I don't want her to be broken she's a survivor 
She just has to learn how to live, and there's a difference. And I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between surviving and living. Mm-hmm. They don't give themselves permission. A lot of mothers don't give themselves permission to really live. You know, they okay. feel indebted to, to raising their children. So I wanted to kind of talk about all these things and show that. And, yeah, and I'm trying to get the support behind it because, in, in you know, first I went the studio route and pitching it, and it's really difficult because, again, they just see um, – you know, commercial films. So they're thinking it's a drama. Nobody wants to see that. It's, it's, you know, I have a single black mother as the protagonist. That's not going to work in the box. Like, you know, they're just looking at it from a really distant, detached kind of level. And I'm like, no, this is a story that even though it's inner city, even though it's a black mother, even though she's, she's single mother, it will resonate with everyone. I think, I think anybody can relate to trying to be better than your circumstances. Yeah. You know, I think we all can relate to waking up every day and saying, today I'm going to try. And even if you fail, at least you got up and you tried. You know, and, and that's, that's the essential message of the film. But the, the, the organizations you talked about were very helpful, and I definitely will research and try to get in touch with them, because the more support I can get around this film, the better. Yeah, um, because of the subject matter uh, that your film presented, I was able to go online and do some research. So on the okay. WLCP radio, we actually provided a link uh, to a Wall Street study uh, that basically shared the information on how devastating single motherhood is. It really does affect our communities and society at large because um, that single mom, very much different than the single father, single parented households that are parented by a woman, their children tend to exhibit uh, more behaviors that are aggressive and violent. And I had to disagree wow. a little bit with that in the newsletter. I, I disagree yeah. because my brothers and, and my sisters and I, we didn't grow up with that aggression. We didn't have that. Right. But that was not to right. say that other children that were growing up without that father in their household weren't aggressive because we did experience a lot of bullying growing up. So it, 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 right. it's not disputed, it, but it's not, you know, concrete ever the evidence that, you know, a single mom, children will be more prone to violent or committing a violent act. These are what the uh, Census Bureau statistics are saying. Um, living in poverty, single moms yeah. tend not to be able to, you know, make ends meet economically. Yeah. Um, they have to make yeah. choices between going through, going to work full time and being out of the home and leaving their children unattended or in the care yeah. of a child care provider where most of their money will, you know, go to that. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And, and I just think that, you know, if we can get the right type of agencies to recognize this work as well as, because while we're poor, we're still buying um, the sneakers for our kids. We still got to buy the mead product. Yeah. We got to buy, I mean, come yeah. on. Listen, Michael is using a mead pencil, and he's got the pencil, and Mom's trying to help him with, the, you know, the mead notebook, uh, the Skechers, all of these products that sell to our children, whether we're poor yeah. or not, we are still buying those things. Um, yeah. So, and even getting counsel, uh, um, some uh, politicians that are living in an area that have high rate of single mother unemployment, you know, these agencies. Let's let's see about, you know, wrapping our head around some type of proposal to approach it. And, you know, as our audience is listening to this, you've got to be creative in your business pursuits of how you yeah. see revenue streams flowing to you. All they can do is say no. And right. what does that cost you? You already don't have anything at your disposal, so you can't <laughs> take that person right. and just move on because the only thing that you're waiting to hear is the one person that's been waiting for you to bring them a product like this to invest in. Right. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, and that's definitely the strategy I'm trying to take now because I realize that, you know, I have to do this film independently, and it is important to me because uh, when I've sent the script out, when I've had producers read it, and even the actors that are attached to it, everybody loves it. You know, they've, they've gotten so involved, and, and and they really want this film to happen, and now I feel a sense of responsibility. I was like, I have to make this film. It has to exist. 
It has to be out there. I know there's an audience for it. So uh, I'm definitely going to, in, in, you know, try all these strategies and try to get the different organizations and the brand sponsorship. You know, it, it takes time, though. <laughs> it, it takes does. time, so it, does. it, it and won't and be that's overnight. You may wanna, that's maybe, maybe where you want to focus your stra- your strategic alignment. Who can make that happen? You know, and yeah. of course, being part of an international organization, who's vested in it? I mean, we have quite a few filmmakers in WOCPFCS. Okay. Um, and you're you in turn helping one, and one helping you. Maybe one of them are is a grant writer. Like we have yeah. uh, Doctor Doctor Gail Myers, who's a documentarian. Uh, we we have we're featuring her also on the show. We've also put embedded her uh, pre uh, promo in uh, our um, series that's currently running Project Iman. And in that we sh- we connected it because she talks about the food and the black farmers in um, uh, rhythms of the land, and we bring oh. to the awareness of how food is. So finding a way to get yourself marketed and the message out there even at this early stage uh, right. to monetize. Have yourself a soiree. Uh, take half on a bar on a good night that's not a, maybe like a Tuesday night. Take your promo out there. Take your actors along with you. Well, the baby can't. Michael yeah. can't be in the bar. Michael, Michael can't, can't be in the bar. <laughs> Michael might His have to be on the me. <laughs> from a distance. Yeah. But, you know, the people that are involved, do your promo and have, you know, a nice little uh, notch for them and let them drink as much as they want, do some raffle giveaways. Actually, um, I'm bringing you this idea piggybacked off of a set of other filmmakers, um, Squeaky Moore and Ashley Shante, who did Father's Day. And they put okay. together in this nice bar in the lower region of, of 23rd and 5th, I believe, um, the okay. Grand Inn or something like that, they put together this nice premiere. And the premiere was only the trailer of Father's wow. Day. Father's yeah. Day was a lot longer, but they, the people came in and it was right after work. Or I believe it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday. They took half uh-huh. of the bar. They had raffles. And then they had people fully aware. Now today, uh, Father's Day is on Magic Johnson's network. Wow. And it's That's all awesome. because of the That's awesome. word of mouth. Word of yeah. mouth and the response. Okay. I have seen filmmakers go to the sports bar and take their production and charge. You know, this is, you, or either you get in for free, but again, taking half on the bar, they're getting entertainment right, plus. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I didn't even think of those ideas. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I will definitely use some of those ideas. They, of course, New Yorkers would think that way. <laughs> you know, for us up here in Brooklyn and Best Buy, it's, it's all about the hustle, girl. It's all about the hustle. <laughs> I know. That's why That's why I was telling people here, I said, I can't stay away too long because I feel like I'm losing my hustle. Yeah, you know, we, New Yorkers we, we, are hard. You get on a really grind, and you know, you just got to do what you got to do. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. not that laid back. When when a vision is in you, you just pump it and you push it, and yeah. it's, it, it's your passion. So you can't let it go. People don't yeah. understand that. Yeah. I'm passionate about doing this, and I can't let it go. You know, right? So, right. To, um, you know, we're gonna have as the you know, broadcast is going, the people are able to go to uh, your website as well as the Indiegogo. Uh, okay. They can also follow you on Facebook, Twitter, yeah. everywhere you are, you have your, your, your project, A Promise. Um, one thing we didn't discuss, you've talked about it and what it's all about, but can you just share the synopsis of this storyline? Sure. Um, A Promise is about a young single mother who um, aged out of the foster care system. Uh, She's raising her kid on her own, of course, because she's a single mom, and she's faced with this dilemma. Her kid is starting to get in trouble in school. He's a smart kid, um, but he's falling into into a bad crowd. 
So the principal makes the suggestion that he go to this boarding school for children at risk. And Philly, who is the lead character, she is, you know, she has mixed feelings about it because she is a recovering alcoholic and her sobriety has been so dependent on taking care of him. It's what's kept her focused. So she's afraid that if she sends him away, she might start drinking again. So the dilemma is, do I send him, which might be better for him, you know, his education, but then he won't have, he might not have a mother to come back to. And her fear is like, if I, if she gets dysfunctional again, she'll lose into the same system that she was lost to. So that's the film, her trying to make this decision, what's best for her and what's best for her son, or is what's best for her best for her son. Mm-hmm. You know, which I, I felt like is, must be a tough call if you were in that situation. You know, and she's doing a good job with him. It's just that, you know, he's getting that age. He's, he's getting ready to hit junior high, hang out with the boys. He doesn't have a father figure, so it's the guys on the street that are the father figure. And, you know, she sees this happening. And I also thought about that, too, for a single mom. That must be hard when you have a boy. And when he starts to get to that age and he, and he wants to discover what it means to be a man and how, you, how hard it must be to try to teach a a boy to be a man and she's dealing with that as well so that's basically what the film is about and we go through the ups and downs of her trying to make this decision and um, also there's a, a subplot in it where there's a love interest and I thought about that too for like a, a single mom dating is a challenge it, you know it's such a challenge how do you find that balance again between your needs and your child, and so she's also dealing with, with dealing with that as well. Like, there's a guy that wants to date her, and she has reservations, and and you know, so that's in the mix as well. Wow, that is, I don't know, that's I love it. I I love the whole thing. The other thing I'll share um, is the generational curse that's there because I saw in the synopsis her mom, she has to face the yeah. issues with the abandonment that she went through going to foster care and um, dealing with with her mother. Now she's faced with this decision, what do I do with Michael? Do I send him away and risk him being angry, you know, with me for sending him away? Yeah. Because it's totally unknown. You don't know how that child is is going to feel. Um, You know, I'll share my testimony. Um, I raised my son. I have, my son is the oldest. Iman, uh-huh. um, um, who viewers are accustomed to seeing in Project Iman. Um, I raised him until he was 10. And behavior, he was, he, you know, like Michael, at almost the same age, falling into the wrong things. Uh, he had stolen um, some food because he's greedy. <laughs> he's greedy. And he stole it's his food. It's funny because in the film I have Michael steal food too at yeah, the La Bodega. He, food. He, need, <laughs> he does not even remotely need to because, you know, I feed the boy. I fed right. the boy. And there was always snacks. I sent him to the store uh, downstairs and he comes back with some extra stuff with a lie that the guy gave it to him. Uh, However, uh-huh, I just uh-huh. find now I can't even recall you know, because he's 20, he's going to be 27. Can't even recall how I found out that he was lying, and I, I really tore him up. Um, and yeah. I was so angry. Um, at this point, I, you know, I've been going to school for him day in, day out, always to complain. And I call his father, who, you know, was instrumental to a degree with him. Um, and I call him, and I, you know, I'm like, I had it, you know, you got to come get him. So we make an arrangement to literally change custody it is a decision that I live to regret because uh, while I disciplined him with love I feel I feel as though he wasn't uh, welcome in the household later on a lot of things uh, and and it precipitated into him eating more and finding comfort in food uh, yeah. Being a single mom, you do not know. You don't know, and you're so fearful. I didn't let my kids really spend nights out. I kept them close. Yeah. I did a lot of things. Um, even sending him to his biological dad was yeah. a hard decision to make. And I, at this point, in hindsight, feel it was not the best decision for us. But all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. But at any point... You don't want to sacrifice your child like that. You don't want to see them, 
being sacrificed to the street. You definitely yeah. don't want to see them sacrificed to neglect or abuse at the hands of yeah. someone they trust and love. Uh, right. You just don't. And I share that because I want the viewers to really get a real sense of a real person dilemma. I, you know, I had a love interest. We are today married. He helped me raise my kids. Oh, he was great. a great, is a great father figure yeah. to my children. He is my children's father. He is my best friend. Um, and we love him dearly. We've come to respect him. But the decisions even in that, because we hear the horror stories. I have a son and a daughter. And today, neither one are off limits sexual wise to a predator. And single yeah. women are at risk of that. Yes, you know? they are. Yes. So and that, that's why I wanted to talk about it in the film because I was like, this is stuff you don't really see in cinema. You don't see, basically, it's, I wanted to tell your story without even knowing this was your story. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what I, that's the story I wanted to tell because th those decisions are so tough and I don't think people understand. Like, I think people are very critical of moms it's a lot right. of the time. They always want to point out what they do wrong and you did this wrong and you didn't do this for me or that. But I'm like, can you imagine... Until you're a mom, you don't know what it's like every day to make a decision. And like you said, don't you don't know if you're doing the right thing or not because you won't know until it's already done. You know, you won't know until you've already made the decision. There's no manual that says this is the right answer and this is the wrong answer. You have you you figure it out through trial and error. And I think that yeah, and moms are held at such such strict rules. Like a mom has to be like you're supposed to have all the answers and. I think people forget that you're human. You know, moms are human. They are. They are. And, and moms, I wanted to show that. Moms are sometimes hard on their self in terms of, yeah. of li yeah. listening to your promo and reading the synopsis. I want to let you know that, um, and don't quote me, we'll, we'll find the exact statistics, but you told my story, but you told tens of millions of other women's stories because yeah, uh, yeah. we are at 82.7 percent wow i didn't realize it was even that high wow fathers are represent the the 17 the remaining 16 or 17 percent and those numbers right. fluctuated for one reason or another i think the fathers increased because the mothers increased. There was something in, in that statistic that just, I was like, well, how did that happen? But, you know, what ha what actually happened, there were a few more single mothers. So, I mean, okay. either the father hasn't stepped up to the plate at all ever, or the father is incarcerated. Right. Those are some of the reasons. Right. Uh, yeah. Or the father is deceased. Or the father is yeah. in the service. Yeah. Um, there are so many reasons for this. Uh, again, viewers, I speak to you emphatically, hit this uh, and go to the Indiegogo that you see uh, website and $5, $10. If you're a single mom and, 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 and you want to share your story, friend her, go to her website, tweet at her, t Twitter, tweet her, one of the two, <laughs> <laughs> uh, tweet her, uh, give her some encouragement with this project so that um, the industries can, the powers that be can see a following, like the page. There's a page on yeah. Facebook, and we'll put, put that link up there as well. Uh, go to our um, newsletter where she is featured in May's uh, monthly newsletter, and you can get that on our website and our blog site, and literally just show support because it's your story. There are tens yeah. of millions of us, 82.7% wow. of us are single moms living in poverty. And perhaps uh, yeah. bringing this message to whatever platform she can bring a promise to will definitely yeah. make some of the political heads take note of what the plight is that we face. We cannot continue to live off what the food stamp benefit was when I was on food stamps 20 years ago raising my my kids uh, when they yeah. were two and three years old. Um, it is not a joke. You know, we can't continue yeah. to afford to pay these high increases in rent and, 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 yeah. and whatnot. We just can't. 
Yeah. More kids are going to bed food deprived in the United yeah. States, the richest country in the world, and it does not make sense. Yeah, and it doesn't make sense how how we're not supportive more of single moms. Like I feel like on a personal level there should be free health care for single moms because I know as a single mom that I'm not a single mom but I have friends that are and they spend so much money in child care. It's like what's the use of working because 50%, 60% of it goes to child care. I'm like this doesn't make sense. How do you ever get ahead? And, um, you know, we, we need to really talk to our politicians and we, we, some changes need to happen because I wasn't aware that the numbers were that big. But that's incredible that so, there's so many um, households that are that are run by a single mom. And, and especially in today's environment, it's it, it's got to be even harder. I mean, you know, we talked about how technology is great and it is great. Um, for us professionally, for adults, it's great. But for children, you know, you have the cyberbullying and you have the predators online. And it's like, as a single mom, if you're working one or two jobs, how do you protect your children? It's like you said, there's so many predators out there. How do you protect your kids from all this when you're so busy just trying to keep a roof over your heads and food on and the food table? And food in the stomach. Food in the yeah, stomach. And we, some of the things that you desire for your children to have, one of the things that uh, influenced my son in, you know, wanting to go to live with his dad and, and even me sending him was that he had more economic stability than I did and I yeah. thought that my son would be able to be better taken care of and perhaps he wouldn't feel, um, you know, desirous of things that I couldn't afford to give him. Right, right. So that's... It's got to be, it's got to be hard. Yeah. yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough, and and like and with this film, I wanted to show reality, you know, and but I also didn't want to make single moms look like victims. You know, that was really important to me not to make people say, "Oh, poor them." It's not poor them, you know. It's not a it's not a weakness to need help, you know. I mean, and and that's another kind of theme I have in the film where I want to say it. Strong people can say, hey, I need some help, too. It's not, it's not that you're weak or – because I hate the way the system kind of makes people feel that way. Like if they're poor, if they're single moms, like, oh, poor you, and you're leeching off the system or whatever. It's not like that. I mean, we should start to think of our country like a family. Absolutely. And we should support – we support these women – because their children are part of our family as well, you know, right. and I think that kind of thinking is not there. Like we, we just see it as like it's their problem, it's not mine. And I want to say that I'm not a single mom, but it's my problem too. Absolutely. You know, it's my problem too that there's other women, my other sisters are struggling like this. I don't like this. Yeah. And so the way I thought about how I would talk about the problem is creatively. I was like, I'm going to write a story about it. And I was also inspired by um, a friend of mine because her niece and nephew actually are in a boarding school for at-risk kids because um, her brother died. He was a drug addict, and so was the mother. So these kids are growing up without any parents, and they grew up, their, their, first, their formative years were brought up in all that instability of having drug addicts as parents. And that also inspired me to write it because I thought, oh, these these poor kids, you know, and, and how they've been shuffled around and 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 how horrible that is. And again, we as a society, we need to step in when things like this are happening. Um, you know, we shouldn't have kids like this get lost to a system. We should also be there to, to, to offer some support because the statistics for those kids are horrendous. Like, you know, more than half of the kids that age out of foster care become drug addicts and alcoholics. And, and, that's now, and, largely, I, and I, Dana, that's largely due to uh, society's desire to medicate our pain and not to get to the root of the yeah. pain. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In school, yeah. if it's, listen, I, I, you know, I did tutoring in school. And I'm going to tell you something, and I also had a daycare. You Kids are full of energy, and they need places to yes. exert that energy. And then if you don't yes. give them the proper diet and they're full hyped up on this, uh, crack sugar that we give people, they <laughs> yeah. have even more energy. So you told, you're telling them, you know, at six, seven, eight years old that they have to come in, 
sit down for these eight hours, some of them even yeah. longer if they're in after school, and just sit there and listen to someone teach. They're not given an opportunity to put their hands and stuff and touch this or talk or socialize. It's right. unnatural. So if you right. have a child who is a little bit more, more, you know, high-level energy, that child is going to be classified as a problem. And when they yeah. continue with this behavior, we need to give them some Ritalin. We need to yeah. give them some protein. Yeah. More of our kids yeah. are on these psychotropic drugs, along yeah. with their unhealthy diets that conflict with the yeah. psychotropic drugs. So when they get out of the foster care or even if they're not in foster care, the minute you take them off those addictive drugs, those legally prescribed addictive drugs, they are they need another drug to fill that place. Yeah. So here yeah. is it's also something that single moms are challenged to face because they are overwhelmed in the cycle, yeah. in a, in another cell. If they have two children or three or four or five, whatever, and they're single mothers, and a lot of times they're frowned upon because they may have a few different baby daddies. And that's yeah. a stigma in and of itself where they're like, you just spreading your legs and you're getting pregnant and you're having babies all over the place. Stop spreading your legs. Use birth control. Some women can't use the birth control. Some women are vulnerable because they they miss the love that they should have had from their father. So they yeah. continue to see yeah. it. There's yeah. a lot of depth in your filmmaking, baby girl. There's a lot of depth. And whether Hollywood recognizes or not, don't be Tyler. When they come knocking at your door and offering you money, say, see you later. They wouldn't want to be. When, you know, when I was in my struggle, you wasn't part of my struggle. So I don't want you to be here, part of my success. Plain and simple. Yeah. You don't have to, you know, take their leftovers. But what you are doing in terms of making a... No, I think you... Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, awesome I think you can tell a story that, that that has soul. Yeah, I think you can tell a film that has soul, has depth, and it can still be entertaining. It doesn't, you know. I that that's kind of my goal with this film is it, it's it's not a message, you know. It's not beating you over the head. This is what I want you to think. It's just telling you a story and 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 showing you the ups and downs because it's not all heavy drama there's some light moments there's some humor in it you know because I wanted to show that too I wanted to show the the beauty and the bond also between mothers and children and how special that bond is and just because she's poor and single mom doesn't mean that she doesn't want the best for her child I think that's a stigma that people see inner city moms or poor moms and they just think just because you you know I have this I have this philosophy just because you don't have money doesn't mean you can't live well because speaking on personal experiences, my mom, who you know, um, I didn't know that a lot of things she did with me was because she didn't have money. I thought she was just being uh, culturally aware. Like she would take me to museums and art galleries and festivals and stuff. And then she confessed to me when I was older. She goes, oh, because it was free. <laughs> and I needed something to do with you. And I had no money, so I was like, yeah. we're going to go to this thing because it's free. And I just thought, when you know, when you're a kid, you don't know. So I just thought, wow, I love this museum. It's great. And this is great. My mom's great. She's taking me all these things. And I think people don't realize that, you know, a poor single mom can want to give her, her child those things and, and does do activities like that with their kids. They're not just sitting around, you know, being abusive to their kids and stuff like that. They're trying. And so I wanted to show that as well. Like, just because she had the misfortune of not having money doesn't mean she's a bad person, mm-hmm. you know, or, or that she's, she's like a criminal. Because I feel like that's how it's always shown with the woman being abusive and criminal. And, and I was like, no, she's a good woman. Or, she's just or, struggling or, with these or, issues. Or drug addict or, you know, someone who's very loose. Um, yeah, in, in their in their uh, givings and in their morals and stuff. And stuff. Yeah, like yeah. she has a good she has a good moral center. Even the character that I created, in spite of everything she's been through, she has a good moral center. It's just, you know, I just wanted to show how hard it must be for mom make as a single mom making these decisions because she could send her kid away 
and he still turns out wild. Doesn't mean just because he's going to the school that everything's going to be great. I mean, it's a it's a gamble. Every choice is is you just don't know. And I wanted to take people on that journey, like look at life through the eyes of a mom, of a single mom, and how hard it must be every day because it is kind with of, it's life and death. It really is like like the the smallest decision can affect your child's life for the rest of their life, the and they have that responsibility. It's just enormous. The enormous responsibility that mothers have is incredible, and I want the audience to have a little empathy and be like, you know what? I'm not going to judge that girl <laughs> or that young woman or that single mom. When I see her with her kids and they're trying to work it out, I'm not going to say, oh, look at you. Why can't you do better? I'm going to say, how can I help you? Um, and and I think it's because I come from a single mom and. And because I, I know single moms, I was like, I firsthand know what a struggle it is and how hard it is. And I, you know, I want I want society to kind of give give single moms a break and yeah. celebrate them a little yeah. more. You know, celebrate, celebrate them a little a lot more. more. <laughs> they, they have to. They have to celebrate them a lot more. I'm going to apologize to everyone. And uh, you know, if you, if you're picking up some background noises, again, it's Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. Uh, construction always <laughs> going on, sirens. Yeah. It's life. It is life. Of um, Dana, let's talk a little bit about the money. How much do you need to make this film? There's two levels I have. I can make it. Uh, my producer, one of my producers here in LA, suggested six hundred twenty-five thousand for my budget. I think that's. I come from Brooklyn, Indy, so I'm thinking. I know I can make it for less than that. So my real goal is three hundred thousand. I know I can make a great film for half the budget. I think that when you're dealing with LA producers, they kind of like think you need all this extraness yeah. that I, I know I don't need. You know, I'm like I don't really need. Like when they even when they try to tell me the crews I need, I'm like, no, I know really talented, great people who will give their, their, their heart and souls for this film. Matter of fact, a friend of mine who is a single mother and a, cinema, and a cinematographer, she wants to DP this, and she has her own equipment. So she's like, I'm in. As soon as you tell me when, we'll shoot this thing, you know. And so I'm like, this is a labor of love for us, so we're like, we're willing to not take either less salaries or no salaries. We're like, we, we don't, we're not worried about that. We're worried about really making the film, you know, making a good quality film. So for me, three hundred thousand dollars is the goal to make this movie. Okay. Uh, calling out what 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 other things do you need besides the money? Um, is the cast already set? Do you? Do I have you, I have two. I have the lead, Mia Fairweather, who is an amazing young actress, and I have the uh, the son casted, who is Terrell Ransom Jr. He actually was on Days of Our Lives. Um, so he played Theo Carver's son, and uh, he's he's amazing. This kid is so talented. So they're already attached. Um, I did want to get some sort of A-list people involved, and that's why the large numbers, because I really wanted to try to get Whoopi Goldberg involved with the film, because mm -hmm. um, I think she'd be a great addition. And and um, so what what I basically need is you mentioned earlier a grant writer. Because I think that if I could get some grant money, that would help. Um, and I was also looking for a casting director because a lot of times when you're going after bigger actors, it's hard to get to them. And I really don't have a name in the industry, so okay. I make contacts with their agents, have, but they kind of ignore me. You have a grant writer. I'll volunteer. I'll volunteer. Okay. That grant. Um, the All right. package for you, placement. You know. Um, oh great! We have a we we have a casting director, Susan Johnston. Really? Yeah, Susan that's, Johnston. That's what my that's what my Indiegogo was about. I was actually raising money to hire people. I didn't know I could just go. go you, to you. Need, you, need, <laughs> you need to come to some AM Power networking meetings, child. Yeah, we we in, in our I do. In, I do. In our organization. I do. In our organization, we we have a lot of resources that you can um, that you can use that you can utilize. Uh, yeah, Susan Johnston, definitely get in contact with her, uh, and you know we can talk off camera a little bit about what you want this grant to look like, um, and and okay. we can see who we can uh, definitely 
get involved uh, with this. Yeah. This project is, is really ripe for um, the national project that I'm preparing a proposal for today, which has to okay. do with um, the San Francisco uh, Peninsula Regional President and uh, Ronnie Savage, who's also a regional president. They have uh, two goals with young girls. To, to, to really bring some social awareness and perhaps we can use this as a platform to also raise funds for your project and get that done, you know, early next year. Do you have a deadline of when you want to get production started? I'm thinking about the spring of next year because um, I want to shoot it back east. I want to shoot it in Berlin. <laughs> okay. So, you know, and I, I want to uh, wait till the weather changes. So I'm thinking like spring or, or early summer would be nice because I have a lot of shots that I want to do outside. And uh, so, yeah, next year is my target, next spring. Okay, great. So we're going to talk to uh, Miss Loretta Green-Williams and ask her uh, to, you know, along with our international projects in Haiti and Liberia, Africa, to include this socially conscious film as one of our uh, uh, projects that we are in support of, meaning we're either trying to find you resources or get you money. So uh, okay. that means that you will have a continuous ad in our newsletter, which uh, is reaching 2.5 million people uh, wow. via courtesy of the New Media Film Festival. Uh, we are being uploaded to their um, database and being sent out, as well as our own networks, which are well beyond the millions. Uh, so this television broadcast broadcast on BCAT, and literally we air on Time Warner, Cablevision, uh, Verizon, and DirecTV to tens of millions of, of uh, cable subscribers. Wow. So, it, you know, it's no small chance that this message will get out and touch the right people. Uh, they'll be able to see the uh, promo that you have, and we're just going to continue to pump it because it is, it's time for us to request media that's socially responsible, and we all don't look like the real nut housewives of Atlanta and Chicago and Florida. Because, you know, or even, you know, the real divas, we do have issues. We do. Yeah. Uh, reality yeah. TV is giving us a bad mental uh, and spiritual image because it's not about whether you're white, black, tearing each other down, putting each other down, and how far you can step up each other and, how, you know, what kind of name brands you can wear, all these kind of garbage we're more intelligent than that, and it's time yeah, to request yeah. some intelligent uh, television production, web productions, and cinema. We, we're tired yeah. of being downplayed, as you say, you know, just buffoons and victims and just just, just not cute anymore. It's yeah. Not, it never was. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, and that's, that's, and there's other filmmakers like me, too, who, would like, that's our, our goal is, like, to to show women of color differently because we are portrayed in these, these stereotypical ways. And, you know, there's more to us than that. I mean, we do have the diva women out there, but then there's real women. And, and you know, I want to, I always want to see real women. And another thing I also want to do, continue to do in my career is I also want to see older women on screen. You know, like, and, and people, and I don't know. That, the, can, I, can I also offer this? We want to see Portly people on television. Yeah, because like you want you want to see the whole thing, the whole the, the whole spectrum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What is yeah. The, what is the reality? You know, come come on, that's um, that's just ridiculous. Of course, here it is. Uh, so I'm not, mm, sorry, again. It's okay, it's live TV. Son, I'm in the middle of a <laughs> interview. Folks, this is Iman on the phone messing me up. Uh, if you're on your way, leave the key and come on later. Love you. You know, I, I tell folks when I'm on radio, I tell them this. Reality is reality. We are not perfect. We are about perfect. I'm able to do what I love 
and do it well from my home. And I'm in my home. Phone rings, dogs bark, things happen. Uh, we have been so conditioned to not address in reality because we want to bring you this crystalline um, type of image where everything's perfect. You you don't know what goes on behind the scene. It gets edited. It gets cut. You know, and that's not yeah. life. You know, that's not life. You talked about this in one of your interviews, I believe it is in Shadow and Act. Uh, yeah. You experience uh, the larger powers that be out there not you know, they think everybody, because you are you have color in your skin, you're African-American. Yeah, that's no something else that, that, yeah, and that's something else that I want to do with my films and with, with in media in general, is I was like, I want to do films that show the diaspora, because uh, black culture is so rich, but it's more than American yeah. culture. And I wanted, to, and, and, you know, being that I went to school in London, and, um, you know, most of my classmates were, you know, their parents were from Africa, from the Caribbean, and, and, and hanging out with people from, you know, different countries. You could see all the similarities. Of course, we're black people. We have, mm -hmm. we have, we come from this number of, some of, but to hear the different languages, to have people speaking French and, and Spanish and, and the little nuances between us, the little differences are so beautiful. And I want to show that as well. And, and, and that, but, you know, in, Hollywood, they don't see that. They think black is a monolithic thing. Mm -hmm. That it's it's very much um, black Southern culture. Because I even try to explain to people, well, New York is very different than the South, which is very different than LA. I'm like, we have our own language, our own swag, our own, you know. And mm -hmm. but they still see us. No, you guys are all one thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that isn't fair because when you see white cinema, you see, uh, you know, somebody can be different, different um, ethnic groups. They can be different classes. I'm like all in one film. And I'm like, why can't we have the same diversity? I mean, there are black people in Latin America. I tried to explain to people. I was like, Brazil has the, the largest black population outside of Africa. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean there's no black Latinos? Or, there, you know, I was like, in England, in London, there's a million black people. And I was like, and the biracial population is just as, as large as the black population. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what do you mean there's no diversity? You go to London right now, everybody's brown. Exactly. <laughs> like, there's hardly any white people. Exactly. I'm like, so I just think it's really interesting that they, a, they don't... We have such a cool... Because of cinema, again, media has presented only certain things in certain light that suited them and the people who were yeah. financing them and their projects. So they have completely slanted the diaspora, completely yeah. slanted culture and cultural diversity. Uh, listen, I, I, I see it as uh, the door that's open for us to go through. We don't have yes. to put the we don't have to kick the door open and we don't have to beg anybody to, to, uh, green light our projects. No. We don't. No. Um, the, 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 the bottom line is, um, you know, the cat's out of the bag. FYI, folks, uh, because you have color in your skin does not mean you're African American. Uh, you can be, uh, Asian and be Jamaican. We have a lot of Asian people. We have yes. Indian people. Yes that are, yes. you know, from the Caribbean as well. They're Guyanese, you know. We have uh, Spanish people that speak the language and they're from Panama. So don't, you know, yes. we can't look at all white people and say, oh, that's a white person because they come from different backgrounds and different nationalities and cultures that we welcome and we embrace. So, you know, yes. it's very um, demeaning to feel as though you can look at a person's color of their skin and understand where they come from, you know. Yeah, or, or understand who they are, because I have, yeah, because I have a good friend who's, um, she's from Canada. She lives in New York now. She lives in Brooklyn, but she's originally from, from Toronto. And, you know, she had somebody tell her, oh, we didn't know black people were in, in Toronto. And she was like, what are you what? Like, and this was from another black person. Yeah, you like. And she was totally shocked. She was like, "Wait a minute, you tried that? You really tried that? You didn't know black people was in Canada? Like, what is it a band? Yeah. You can't go there." 
he really, yeah. she really experienced that, and I, and, and we kind of laughed about it. And I was like, that's why I want to make films that show black people from different countries and different cultures. I was like, wow, our, our, our own people here in America, some of them don't realize there's black people everywhere. <laughs> I mean, they're every. Everywhere. I was explaining to people, I said, you know, there's black people in Spain, right? There's black Spanish people who, who yeah. are, like, born and raised in Spain. And, and they're like, really? They're always shocked. And I'm like, it, the same diversity in the States is the same yeah, diversity they, they everywhere gotta else. That, they got to get out of those co- cocoons and um, explore the world. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Um, I'm, so, I'm so happy that we do have... Uh, cultural diversity. I am so happy that we are all different, and um, I'm excited about, you know, filmmakers that are producing bodies of work that embrace that rather than, you know, try to fit into the box and say, well, if I produce it this way, they won't, you know, I- I'll never get to the big screen. The big screen font yeah. is becoming a lot smaller. If yeah. you know anything about cinema now, the movies, you'd be like, oh, they just came out in the movies. It's on DVD already. It just got on DVD. It's already on yeah. you know, pay per view. Wow, I right. just, and now it's on you know regular cable. So the, the 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 powers that be, because they have created a, a, a network through the web, they kind of leveled the playing field for us. So it behooves us to truly. Um, embrace the new technologies and begin to use it for our benefits, uh, to educate yourself on how do you monetize, how do you set up a blog, and, you know, how do you do a Google Hangout where you can have a whole full concert? Uh, you know, how, how do you live stream a full feature film? How do you live stream a play? And networking with people who are grassroots like yourself, working from their home and able to give you these things at a deeper discount. So, um, yeah. we, we, we've had a blast with you, Miss Dana Verde. Thank it's you. Awesome. It's been great. It's been a great conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the kind of host that I am. Toot, toot. <laughs> <laughs> you so Brooklyn. All right. Hey, best die, do or die. Um, thank you so much, Dana. You're we're welcome. going to um, keep folks posted with your project. Uh, if you have a URL that you... Uh, have other than the ones that we've put up that you want people to connect with you on, you know, please send us that link or give it to them now. Okay. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I can tell you a little bit about, I'll tell you about a little other side business I have going on besides my film business. It's, okay, um, great. Awesome. it's my new, it's, it's my new media company and it's called 3CK Media. So you can go online, just type in 3CKmedia.com. That's my website, and, and basically what I'm doing with the new media is what we just talked about, which is bringing diversity. So it's because 3CK is a sociological term for, for global nomads. So um, that's Ooh. why I named the, co- the company 3CK, yeah, so it means okay, third so culture you kids. Purchased, you just brought yourself another 10 minutes. Go ahead. Tell us about this. That's oh, my God. Three, okay. What is it? What uh, is it? Three? 3CK. Three three? It stands for third culture kids. Yeah, 3CK. And it, 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 it's a it's a it's a sociological term about people who grow up outside of their parents' cultures, and so I feel like that's every American because we're all you know originally from somewhere else, and now the world is so transient. People move so much and culture swapping. I like that's the world right now. We're all three CK kids, you know. We're all three CK. So that's the name of my company, and what I want to do with the new media company is show you that diversity, what we were just talking about, like, who is the, the hottest singer in Spain? Because there's this, this um, flamenco singer who she is af- of African descent, and she's bad, and I love her, and I want to introduce her to an American audience, and who's doing what, and it's so, so it's to share art and culture throughout the world, so we all can speak and talk with each other and introduce things to each other. So you can always follow me on Twitter, because actually we tweet about different things, like food, Art, culture, anything, anything like what do you love to eat? And, and mm. people, we have people from all over the world, from like Egypt and stuff, swap, swapping recipes. You know, this is what I like and, and this is what you eat. And so it's just to create this like global conversation um, because my philosophy behind it was something my, my father taught me when I was really little. He said that um, we're all human, so find that thing in common when you meet someone. You know, he taught me to see the what's what, how we're alike, not how we're different. 
And that's what 3CK Media stands for. Find those human connections. We're all human beings. We should be able to relate to each other. And uh, so, yeah, so people can check that out. And, and we're going to be eventually doing, like, little online broadcasting shows, which I call mobile device broadcasting. So it's strictly for you to watch on your iPhones and on your iPads. Uh, they won't necessarily be web series. They'll just, you'll just download the app and you'll be able to watch our shows. And they always have this very global kind of thing to them. Wow. I would love for you, uh, we're friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. I would love for you to connect with, uh, write the name down, Ramona Wright. She's actually uh, in uh, California as well. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. scheduled to interview her in, an, in a couple of days. Very big in media. Her brother is in Amsterdam uh, producing. Um, he's uh, Voltatar Davis, uh, a social media app that connects on this kind of level that you're talking okay. about. Uh, yeah. Very, very unique brand, brand of, of thinking. Also, they are brother and sister. Uh, their mother and I were college classmates, uh, older okay. college classmates. She actually passed away uh, shortly after we got our degrees. Single mom bringing up these two kids uh, uh, on $14,000 income. But she taught them to dream and dream big, and I know your mom also taught you that, to be very independent, yeah. free-thinking, and um, to yeah. dream big. So um, I think they would be ideal connections for you because of this new media wave that's going about and the social responsibility that you guys are bringing back to cultural diversity, the diaspora. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. You know, I just thought, of, thought to... Uh, to share that with you and, and um, I'll, oh, I'll make a internet connection for you. Please uh, yeah. do, please do because yeah, because that's what I that's what 3CK is all about. It's it, again, it's because of the short film what inspired me to start the company was Lock and Key. You know, even though it was rooted in Brooklyn and it was it was Afro Latino culture, it resonated. I mean, the film screened in London, screened in Trinidad, it screened, it went global. And then the more I traveled with it, and I met people from the diaspora, from the Caribbean, from Europe. You know, I, I met this guy when I was in Trinidad who grew up in Germany, but his parents were originally from the Caribbean. And so he's very European, but he's also Caribbean, and he likes American culture. And we started talking, and we watched the same movie. We like the same stuff. And I was like, people need to know this, that here's this black man who grew up in Germany, and we're laughing over French films we like. And, and you know, and I was like... There needs to be more dialogue. So that ignorant comments like the guy who said, black people are in, Tr- in Toronto, that won't happen. They'll be like, of course, black people, black people are doing everything and anything. There's no limits. There's no, there's no social limits to being black. You know, you don't have to stay in the hood and be ghetto. That's not the only thing that black stands for. To me, I always saw black as a, as I had a pan-African kind of mentality where black is this prideful global thing. And, yeah. And I want people to know what we contribute, not only in music and entertainment, but politically, you know, yeah. let them know that, you know, there, there are people in Parliament in England who are black. And, they're, you know, like, let them know that like, we're making strides globally. Yeah. You know, it's not just not don't just look at your I guess like, what I want to say is, like, I look at the world as a global village. So look at the whole world as your family. Look at the whole world as your community. And. We can learn from each other, and, and if we unite, it just makes us stronger as a, as a people. As a people. And I really believe that. So, I mean, you can't just segregate and say, I'm African-American and I'm over here, and the Caribbeans are over there. And the, No, they're your, they're your cousins. They're, they're your family. You should be able to talk to them, and you should watch their movies and buy their music as much as they watch your movies and buy your music. And you should know what's going on politically there with them. Because, yeah. believe it or not, it does affect what happens here. We are interconnected, you know. And yeah, we are. We, we are. Yeah. It, it's going to take your generation to help us recognize that yet again. Um, it's going yeah. to take uh, a Volatar Davis to create a social app. It's going to take a Dana Verde with a, a, a business uh, venture that connects us beyond what the media has projected because the media has done such a poor job 
an image yeah, of us. Yeah. And they branded us, um, you know, not just the African American culture, but the Caribbean culture, the Latino culture, uh, the Asian culture. Yeah. They have stereotyped us so poorly till we ourselves begin to ingest that that's what we are. And, and it, it's so not. Nice. Yeah. It's so not. Nice. Yeah. So when we can position uh, visionaries like yourself that are on the thinking outside of the box and on the cutting edge of this uh, social media, new media change, the story hasn't yet fully been told what it's going to be. But guess yeah. what? There's so much room for it to be anything you want it to be, anything you dream yeah. it to be. Uh, they have given us a open door to make it whatever. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely a good time. And, and, and you know, I just started 3CK uh, December is when we got incorporated, and, and this, the website's up there. You can follow, you know, you can follow us on Twitter. I mean, we're all every day, like we have on, we have food day and there's like a day where that's all we talk about is food and what are you eating and how do you make it? And I, I love reading the feeds, reading the conversations and people sharing recipes and sharing what they love. And, and, and then we also have on Fridays, which I want to encourage the audience out there to join us on. We call it discovery day. And it's like, what did you discover this week? Tell us what you discovered new. And it's really interesting to hear what people discover about themselves, about the world, and it's all about sharing. Now, so, you know, you, you shouldn't be telling me this because every time I I, I see something, now, I did, we did an AM Power Networking where um, LaTanya S. Johnson taught us to use social media causes to raise funds. Now this mm -hmm. might, this is a, you know, my brain goes ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching all the time. <laughs> I'm thinking with 3K Media being a sponsor for the Dana Verde film production of Promise, creating a social course where people can just drop a dollar in for every yeah. time they learn something different, you know, and that's the challenge yeah. right there. Tell us how many things you learn different and, you know, create a little maybe uh prize for them where they can get um restaurant tickets or movie tickets or yeah, you yeah. know um partner with some I, other kind of whatever and you know they're actually feeding into it they give you the dollar and you tell them the dollar will go towards you know the making of this culturally diverse film that shows us how to be more culturally aware and sensitive to single mothers yeah. So yeah. No, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. I'm not going to show you. I didn't even think of that. I'm not. I'm not going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. You know, that's a I, great I, idea. Our ideas. We 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 tend to forget folks in the era that we're living in. They are valuable. They are invaluable. Yeah. And pe folks are listening yeah. and looking for great ideas all of the time. Um, I don't see things as competition. If you're a filmmaker and I'm a filmmaker, we are not in competition. We are networking. Nah. We, become, yes. we become a sisterhood that can help build the other um, and carry the yes. other because we, we, in essence, you know, we, we, we all have a lot in life, meaning that there's something charged in us. There's a purpose for us. And because God said it, he's going to bring it to pass. So you don't have to look at other people's projects when they go up as oh you know why them why not me that's not no that's not I think no, no. yeah mm -mm, mm -mm. no that's I think I, I always believe in supporting people like that's what I miss about being back home <laughs> being back in Brooklyn because I had such a tight network of people and we would work for each other it was a barter system you know it was like I would camera out for somebody and then they would camera out for me if I needed them. And we, that's how we got our projects made. Even um, with Lock and Key, I just bought everybody food. There was no there was no money. I wrote the script. A couple of my friends liked it. And we said, hey, let's just make it. And I've worked with people. And because I've, I've gapped for people and I've done things for them, they were like, we're in. You know, that's the, it was our, our services is our currency. We, we give to each other. We help each other get our projects together. So it's different now being in L.A. because it is very competitive here. So people 
don't want to share yeah, like that. Their, mind, they don't, they don't their, their get... mind, their mindsets haven't shifted. Their mindsets have not shifted. Yeah. I mean, I have done two documentaries, and I think at the most I did, uh, I did uh, the making of La Bella Diva. I have no budget for any of the documentaries that I've done. Right. Um, on my first documentary project, that is it me. Um, we had a locate. We had two locations for free. We had a second cameraman, two cameras, um, no, and absolutely no budget. I think I brought him a honey bun and a juice. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, you know, like as long as you're well fed, you know. <laughs> juice at that, a fifty cent juice, and I think the honey oh, bun was right. seventy five cents. Um, I paid his <laughs> car fare. We had actually someone um, pick us up, and I might have gave him twenty dollars for the gas to take us from location yeah. to location. Um, it got done, and today yeah. it, on my YouTube channel, "Fat Is in Me" continues to be a hot item. Um, unbeknownst to me, it has traveled the globe. Uh, it's in Portugal wow. and some other places. Uh, people wow. are looking at that message without a budget. Yeah. And with a and and yeah. with, you know we we did have the studio cameras for that project. The next project I used a bloggy, a Sony bloggy, and then I had an HP camera. And when one would run out of the battery, I shot it. You know, um, and then I also shot with the uh, with one of it. So you see various dimensions of the film in the making of La Bella Diva. I had a makeup artist, and that was one of the charges that I incurred because the uh, setting was, you know, making her up, taking, because it's trans, a transgender, and we take her, you know, from her day look to a more glamorous type look, and she shares her story with the um, with the makeup artist, you know, growing up right. um, as a boy and being um, uh, brought up by an abusive father who she later finds out was her stepfather, and the struggle that she goes through with her uh, own identity, knowing that she's trapped in her right. own body. It's an amazing 15-minute right. short short. Um, wow. And we had yeah. really limited budget, but I say this to the viewers. Don't limit your dreams by what's in your bank account or what's in your pocket. Sometimes when you just go and you talk to people and you share what your vision is, they won't always steal your idea or try to piggyback your idea. They may say, listen, I want to help you with that. Yeah, they'll support you. They'll support you because that, that's what I learned. You know, I kept thinking I needed all these budgets and all this stuff. And when it, when I went to, or when my film was screening at Urban World and people were talking about their budgets, like they spent 30 grand and all this money. And I was just like, well, my film uh, it was a bunch of Pucci Frito. I bought some chickens and some rice and beans. I was like, that was my... And some Dunkin' Donuts. I was like, that's what I paid my people. <laughs> I was like, I, you know, they just really loved the film. We really just loved creating. And, and, and I was really amazed by how well it performed. And that, that was a lesson I learned from that, that it's, it's when you have a good story and you have people that believe in it. Mm -hmm. That's what makes a film really good. Like, you can have all this money and all these, these tools, but it doesn't mean that the, the film is going to be any better. Just and it doesn't that mean that it's going to be a success if it ever hits yeah. the box office. Anyway, yeah. because we've had great films uh, and great plays with great um, great amount of money at their disposal, and guess what? Yeah. They were a bust. They, they flop. They yeah, flop. they flop. Yeah. We're going yeah. to get the coochie fritos and the rice and beans <laughs> and the Dunkin' Donuts going again. Make a back-end deal and pay everybody on the back-end because we really yeah. want to see a promise. We want to see it. Great, great. I, I really want to bring it to you, so I'm working on it. Okie dokie. Thank you. Is there anything else that you feel you want to share? No, that's it. Just, just a promise and 3CK Media. Okay, you got it. it. All right, folks, that was our first uh, interview on Uvu with Miss Dana Verdi for WOCP TV. And again, I'm your host, Jasmine Farnham. I'm also going to be sharing with you guys uh, ways that you can connect, uh, become a member of Women of Concern Professional Strategic Conscious Network. Here, I'm building my region on the East Coast, but we have seven regions that span um, in California. We have international projects going on God's Planet um, Haiti, 
which is a project that we are undergirding, uh, supporting the education of 40 children, I believe, from grades K through the 12th grade. And um, if you visit our website, you can find out how you can make a donation to that organization. We also are undergirding a project in Liberia, Africa, uh, B4 Youth Theater. The founder of that organization is Jasmine Blanks. And what she has done is taking the youth of Liberia, war-torn country, and giving them a voice through creating um, theater and writing their plays and producing their plays, which they have performed before the President Sir, Sir Lee Johnson and dignitaries in, throughout the Africa region in, in that area. So we're also undergirding them with supplies and helping them to get um, interns over there or give a stipend to the people that are coming to aid her in, in that cause. We also are full-fledged. Today we had our business to business networking out in California. Our founder, Loretta Green Williams, did that. Uh, along with uh, the other regional heads, Dr. Kat Corinne Jackson Holder was with her in that event. Um, we have so many other events. Please just visit www.wocpsen.com. And there goes those sirens. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> and this is Bobby, hear that. I'll give it to you again, www wocpsen.com for more information on how you can join, follow our events. Uh, membership is open. It's really regional and uh, 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 reasonable. And as you can see, as I shared with Dana Verdi, we have a host of resources, which are ourselves, our talents and our gifts that we support Dana with. She's a member, a founding member, and she sits on our international board so um, go to the website and find out the benefits of being a part of WOCP FPN. And if you have a story that you would like to share with WOCP radio, TV, or newsletter, or perhaps all three, send me an email with a story, uh, the subject line, story to tell, at jwfarnham2005 at msn.com. That's J as in Jackie, W as in Wendy, Farnum, F-A-R-N-U-M, 2005 at msn.com. It's been a blast, folks. We so thank you for um, joining us. And, Dana, we look forward to having you back a 